Hey, Valentine's Day is coming up, and I'm here to find out what's colder, the weather or people's hearts. Hey guys, we're just talking to people about Valentine's Day. You hate dating? I never have, really. Yeah. Like love, anarchist, kind of? I think kind of just like love every day. Anniversaries and like days that are special Got it. to you versus like gossip, yeah. Sure. And we're talking to you about Valentine's Day? Okay, okay, have a good one. She didn't like me. Do you and your partner have any Valentine's Day plans at all? Are you doing any din-din? I'm married, so I, okay. yeah, I couldn't even comment on the dating scene. It's all capitalism, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Do you have any Valentine's Day plans going on? I am going to see one of my girlfriends in Philly. <gasps> one of your girlfriends, like a friend, or you have like multiple? A friend, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was like, okay. <laughs> Valentine's Day always falls close together with President's Day. <laughs> and so, unfortunately. And you're very into President's Day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Forget Valentine's Day. It's all about the historical U.S. president. <laughs> yeah, I'm going. working. You, I'm no. a florist. Don't feel bad if you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a friend. COVID changed the dating scene in more ways than we could have imagined. For singles living alone, physical touch suddenly became a scarce commodity, which was a struggle considering it's vital to our well-being. And while the six feet rule forced some of us to get creative, it caused others to experience a spike in anxiety and depression. But Grandma's Hugging Machine wasn't the only precaution that emerged from a world ruled by social distancing. For online singles hoping to hook up, there's vaccinating, a trend that encourages users to post their vaccine status on their profiles. So Miguel, 24, 3.2 miles away, can not only sport his perfectly curated thirst trap, but also share which brand of the Fauci Ouchie he got. This guy like was hitting on me at the bar and it was like height of the pandemic. We just got back to work. And he was like, I'm gonna kiss you. And he like grabbed my face and kissed me. And I was like, oh my God, I have the virus. And I was freaking out over it. And with more than 44 million Americans dating online and millennials making up the largest sector, the pandemic has redefined the billion dollar business of finding the one or two or four. I mean, we had a guest on our show who matched with a guy on Match.com back in the day, never met up with him in real life, saw him years later at a concert, and then they got married. Since I've used apps since 2010, I believe, so we're talking 10 years, and I feel like even the way I operated, I went from serial dating to never getting past a third date to now meeting like the love of my life through an app. So it really just depends so much Ooh, she's on- she's the love of her life. Yeah. <laughs> Before they wanted to just, you know, hook up and not actually look for a relationship. But now people are more interested in finding a relationship and they have more intentions of dating. Intimacy in the digital age is elusive enough, but it's never been tested quite like it has in a pandemic. And while media outlets preemptively forecasted shock girl summer in 2021, rebounding COVID waves initiated what might be the biggest post-pandemic dating trend of all, intentional dating. Being locked down made folks wanna lock it down. For over a decade, we've been uh, working with Match on the Singles in America project. It is the largest and most comprehensive study ever done of singles. One of my favorite findings in our study this year, this uh, what we're calling intentional dating. Singles are wanting to be better versions of themselves. I think particularly after the pandemic, after this trauma we were all through. 81% of Gen Z and 76% of millennials say that they want a relationship within the next year. This sort of growth, this emotional growth uh, particularly in their, their dating space when it comes to love and sex and relationships and courtship, really wanting to be more focused, more intentional. If they're using apps, they're really trying to make deeper connections. They, they want to get off the apps and connect with people in person. As far as the pandemic is concerned, I feel like there are a ton of people who didn't realize how important relationships were before that are now craving love and intimacy. They before just, you know, were having a fun time in the meantime type of partner situation. And now people are being very strategic and specific in like what they want. They know, okay, I don't want to spend another year alone in quarantine. Um, and, or maybe I was with someone who I wasn't that compatible with that the pandemic brought out our lack of compatibility. 
Online dating in a pandemic also forced people to have longer conversations over video calls or texts before meeting IRL. And there's a new kind of romantic courtship for the 21st century known as hardballing, where people are upfront about their non-negotiables, like uh, cats or dogs, kids or no kids, conservative or liberal, big ear Tupac, flat earther or mentally stable. Um, I'm trying to think of like hard, fast ones that I, I think like patriarchy and feeling like there's someone's talking oh. down to me. I think that would not, that would be a deal breaker for sure. The deal breaker for me would be someone who just cannot see the world the way I want to see it. But someone who's narrow minded, someone who believes that I've actually met someone who thought America was the best country in the world. <laughs> does not ever want to leave the country. He's never left the country and he doesn't understand anybody who would ever do that. That is a deal breaker to me. If I, if we go out on a date and I say I'm, I'm vaccinated, I'm masked, it's a signal that says, well, I care about other people and I care about you. Um, all the other politics aside, at the end of the day, in this dating context, I'm showing some empathy and care. That's a really important factor in dating. We look for that in partners. We look for signals of where we might think that they exhibit some empathy, some concern. 53% of singles said that someone's political affiliation is important. Uh, and about half in different categories, saying that the Black Lives Matter is important, that LGBTQ rights is important. Um, yeah, anywhere from uh, about 40 to 60%, so about half um, uh, are landing on some of these issues and saying that, you know, these are, these are important to us. Although online dating communities are being more honest about who they are and what they want, looks like ghosting and benching are here to stay. Do you have any like dating horror stories? Unfortunately, no, I'm more of a boring guy. I don't have oh. anything that was just awful and terrible. I've been with my wife for seven years. No, unfortunately. What have been some positive stories? My partner and I went upstate and just like watching movies and like That's baking so nice. together and just spending that quality time together. Have you had any like horror stories in terms of dating? Yeah. 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 There's only this one where like we disagreed on every single thing with the guy. After one drink we were just like, okay. Never been ghosted? No, I usually am the one Listen. ghosting. Oh my god. Okay, I'm retiring from the biz. But maybe the worst kind of dating deception comes in the form of woke fishing. Woke fishing, a term coined by vice journalist Serena Smith, is when someone feigns caring about the same social or political issues as you for the sole purpose of reeling you in, only to disappoint you when you find out they're actually transphobic climate deniers who believe the federal government's controlled by an elite group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles. I love the term woke fishing, right, in terms of thinking about um, how people are leveraging um, their commitments to things like uh, feminism or feminist practice or gender equity. Several years ago in our Singles in America study, we asked uh, men and women whether the Me Too movement, as it was really starting to rise, um, whether it was impacting their dating, their dating lives. 51% of men said it changed their behavior. Now, fast forward to now, we said, okay, a couple of years later, what's still going on? And do people really care about it? Or are they doing, um, you know, this what, what psychologists call virtue signaling? What we found this year was that 60% of men, so six out of 10 men, said that it's important that their partner supports the Me Too movement. And I think that's a really interesting measure because it doesn't just say, hey, I'm committed to it. It says, I want a partner who's committed to it. Nearly half of 18 to 29 year olds say they've used a dating site or app to search for a potential match, leaving algorithms and filters to do the critical work of helping many Gen Z and millennials find love. One time when I brought a girl, to a restaurant and she brought her dogs, all four of them. She would just grab the bread or the pieces of calamari and just kept feeding her dogs. The owner asked us to leave. She got up upset because they weren't tolerant with her dogs. I was just upset because I didn't get a chance to try my steak. We went to a science museum. It's like a very tall building and it was going great until he wanted to go to the very tip top of the building. I'm terrified of heights, so I didn't really want to go, but it was my first date. I ended up having an asthma attack. Don't try to act cool on your first date. We went to a movie date. It was to see The Lion King, um, the live action version. I was so hyped for that. This girl literally sang all the songs in The Lion King at the top of her lungs. Like no humming, no like light, like jamming. People in the back were literally gonna tell me to like handle this girl. 
and I wasn't going to because at that point I was so fed up. And while these algorithms are supposed to result in matchmaking made simple, not all are entirely user-friendly. And by that, I mean that for some users, algorithms and filters can promote prejudice. So at its most basic level, an algorithm is just a set of rules or instructions for how to solve a problem, usually optimizing for a specific goal. So for example, um, you know, when you order a food delivery, the algorithm actually is what matches your order with the closest delivery person to optimize for speed and efficiency. In an ideal world for a dating app, the algorithms would be designed to match you to your ideal partner as quickly as possible so that you can get off the app and go on with the business of living your blissful lives together. Unfortunately, that's not usually how it works. So for the dater, your goal is to pinpoint your soulmate as quickly as possible and then get off the dating app and go on with your lives. Uh, but for the app, they typically charge a monthly subscription. And so they're, from a business perspective, their sole goal is to keep you on the dating app as long as possible. So in other words, if their matching algorithms were too efficient in quickly matching you up with the perfect partner and getting you off the app, they would put their, themselves out of business. The biggest issue with dating apps is the people using the dating apps. For some reason, we've kind of abused that technology. There's no way to see if someone is kind or compassionate or trustworthy or even funny, really. And that makes us fixate on things that ultimately don't matter as much in a long-term partnership. It's really interesting dynamic that we've created these rules, essentially, of how to use apps that really don't correlate to how we meet in real life there's this expectation with dating apps because you're using it to meet someone to date. When you meet someone in real life, you're just kind of seeing where it goes. And that's just such a better way to set up the potential than going in with so much expectation. If this person's dragging on and they're not asking you out, that's a huge red flag that this person is just trying to satisfy some attention or some voids. They're trying to get their love cup filled up with whatever, you know, gooey goodness you have to offer as a great person. The first FaceTime should be within the first week. If you've had phone conversation, you guys have been texting, that's great, but you want to at least FaceTime. And then the second element is now we need to go out and physically meet in person. So that should all happen within two weeks max. Some trans women have been banned from Tinder, despite the app's inclusivity pledge, leaving the community with little to no recourse for having their profiles reinstated. My name is Morticia Godiva. I am a writer and an actress, um, a filmmaker, producer, dancer, storyteller, black trans woman. So Feeling Like an Orchid is a short film that I wrote about a queer polyamorous relationship. I play Morticia. It's about 15 minutes, but you kind of get to see a little bit of like a peek into like what dating could be, what dating may look like as a, a person of color. So where are you from? I'm from Florida. No, but like, where are you really from? We have a moment where it's giving, I'm here for a, a green card. Um, <laughs> and then we also have this moment where it's like, can I touch your hair? Like, I feel like both very extreme, but also kind of, again, poking at what discriminatory moments can look like in a dating situation. And even when exclusion doesn't come from the algorithm itself, it can come from the app's users, especially when you can get someone booted off the app simply by reporting them for their gender identity. There's a word for that. Ah, yes, discrimination. There have been dating apps that have banned trans profiles and wrongfully so. So there's that issue of how are the dating apps themselves treating trans people or non-binary people. But the there's also like the user issue of like, I still have to choose whether I'm gonna show up as a binary gender category, which can feel really bad for non-binary people or trans people. And that becomes part of the issue that if there are transphobic people and I choose to show up as the gender I am, but you don't like trans people, then I'm putting myself in danger. There, there are a few dating apps where you can choose your gender and then you choose the genders that you swipe on and it's more expansive like um, OkCupid and Field have that. But most of the popular ones, you still have to choose a binary gender category, which starts you off from the get-go in like a, I don't love this, this doesn't feel right. My favorite dating app is Lex. Um, that's for queer people except for cis gay men. So any other gender identity is welcome there. 
Um, and Lex is basically, it's a dating app, but it's also a community app. So you'll find things like I'm in search of a roommate or I am um, I'm looking for someone to have sex with me in a really particular kinky way or I'm looking for a date to this concert I have two tickets for. It's a photo list platform that harkens back to old school personal ads. As if trying to find the gym helper to your Pam Beasley wasn't difficult and anxiety ridden enough, the complexities and barriers presented by online dating can exacerbate user skepticism, which is ultimately counterproductive to the app's intentions. I always prefer in-person dating only because I feel like pictures can be so hit or miss. The most horrific date that I've ever been on would have had to have been with a guy that I met in Florida. We went to dinner by ourselves. I felt like I was on an interview for a job. <laughs> I remember him asking me what my credit score was and I was just like, what is this? <laughs> we had ran into some of his friends and one girl like was just stepping on my toes all night. And she was like eating off my date's plate. And then when she dropped us off at home, she like put the car in park and was like gonna come in. And I was like, look, no more. <laughs> And he was like, you know, you're kind of being mean to my friend. And I was like, are you serious? I thought I was holding back all night. Speaking of which, these days, because many of the matchmaking heavy hitters have gone public, rather than measuring their success rate by the number of successful pairings, it's measured by the number of subscribers. I think what's interesting in the dating context is that question of what does success look like? What, how do we want to define what an optimal couple is? Because longevity of relationship is one factor, um, but there's other things such as the quality of the relationship, communication, physical intimacy, all these other different factors that could be what you optimize for. And that's basically just a data science problem. It's saying, let's find, uh, define success how you want. And then you have to train the models on a lot of people who have that uh, attribute in common. And then you can actually predict it using, um, using the dating app. I love dating apps because it's given people the opportunity to connect outside of their normal social group. The more practice that you get on there, you start to learn like, hmm, and start to come to the realization, maybe it's me, maybe it's what I'm putting forward or how I'm showing up. And maybe that's why I'm not having success. Let me call in the big dogs. Let me get some actual expert help. Then this is where I come into play. The less success that you have on dating apps, the more you are in need of me. <laughs> dating apps have become incredibly more diverse, catering to a variety of idiosyncrasies. There's a dating app for famous people, religious people, farmers, people who don't eat bread, people who love bacon. There's even one that connects people with beards to those who want to stroke beards. It's really important to find an app that could be safe for the Hispanic community. So Latiner, uh, the app, has actually 143,860 users on the app since May of 2020. The app was made by Hispanic people for the Hispanic people. So the people in the Latin community feel safer when they go on the app than just going on different apps and feeling discriminated. With a smaller niche app, what they do is they try to find their perfect match for each person. The Hispanic community is the second largest group in the US. Sometimes you wanna cultivate that background and you wanna meet people that have the same interests. And according to Match Group CEO, Shar Duby, the next phase of dating apps is going to be fueled by technology that'll allow for more organic, more lifelike ways of getting to know people. Like in the metaverse, where Match has plans for avatar-based virtual experiences that could cross over to apps across its profile, like Tinder. Uh, have you heard about the dating in the metaverse? Situation? I no. have not, but that's not something I feel mentally prepared to talk about. <laughs> Are you Valentine's Day? No. It's kind of like what you're just saying now, which is everyone's dating in this alternate universe. Oh God, <laughs> very Matrix-like. I've heard about it, but I yeah. don't really know what it is. Do you think you would ever be willing to date in the metaverse? Ah, uh, I mean, never say no, right? You're open to holding hands with a cyborg. <laughs> Someone would have to explain to me what the metaverse is first before I could opine upon online dating. Sure. I have been looking at a piece of real estate in the metaverse just because someone said that I'm okay. supposed to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard about it. Do you think you would be into that? Never, no. 
You I don't, not I'm not even into the whole metaverse <laughs> thing. It's just like, I love my life. Yeah, I'd rather die yeah. than do that. But could so much technological innovation result in online daters spending even more time in a virtual space rather than a real one, especially as concerns over COVID-19 spikes and surges persist? Or can these companies evolve without losing sight of their users' bottom line? Finding real life human connection. Honestly, I'm not sure anymore. Whatever happened to worrying about catfishing or serial killers? Simpler times. We believe that the metaverse is not the way for human connection. When we talk to our listeners, what do they crave the most in dating? It's the affection, it's the eye contact, it's the energy you feel around someone when you're physically around them. The good news is, as the demand for dating apps continues, the opportunities to find your perfect match are ever increasing and for the most part, becoming more inclusive so that anyone can find love, even your pups. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2022. Thanks for watching Radar 2022. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, we've all got issues. Some of us more than others.